your accounting and you know human beings and large numbers generally don't mix very well um, in terms of you know accurately counting. So uh, this product basically you just put your petri dish or whatever it is on there, press a single button, it instantly will count it. There is no number of colonies that's too large for this thing to count. So um, it's really interesting technology, but is pulling me out of the prestigious halls of Stanford and Harvard mm -hmm. and putting me, you know, on a manufacturing floor in a chicken processing plant or something like that. <laughs> Good morning, Colin. Good morning, bud. Good to be here. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for fun when you're not actively managing a sales team? Yeah, so a number of things. Um, big part of moving back here was, you know, access to the natural beauty. Um, so we recently moved into uh, Old Town Daphne, um, and we have a uh, our own little bay access down at the end of our street. So well, thank you for making the commute in this morning. Of course, yes. Yeah, you know, a very short commute compared to uh, some of mine yesterday. Let's see, I drove to Baton Rouge and back. Oh and Had wow. a few meetings in between. Um, so yeah, short commute to get here. Um, but yeah, lots of uh, time watching sunsets on the bay, and then I do a lot of three D printing. Just because it's you know a fun, tangible way to release uh, creativity um, and practical. What so, items do you like to print? It varies um, from like my wife had her coffee cup that didn't sit at the right angle under our coffee maker and would spill. So I just designed like a little wedge for it to sit on. Um, or even for work, recently I designed a um, couple fixtures for customer parts and um, also like a polarizer adapter for my microscope, which I never thought I'd even say that sentence, you <laughs> yeah. know, when I was wandering the halls of uh, Spring Hill over here. But um, yeah, you know, so whatever I can do to um, keep my hands busy and then I, I play music and I sing. Um, so awesome. If I'm not on the uh, 3D printer. I'm probably on the piano. What are the 3D printed objects made out of? Um, plastic. Uh, so... Specifically, the type of plastic I use is called PLA, um, which is just one of the easier materials to print in. But honestly, you'd be surprised. They have metal filaments that you can print and then put in a, a forge to make solid metal parts. They have wood filament. They can print in chocolate now. It's, it's, it's wow. pretty interesting, yeah. Um, what's your What item that you've printed do you use the most in your day-to-day? So I'd say I have this uh, dog whistle that I printed. Um, and the cool thing is I didn't design it. I had no hand in making it. I just downloaded a file. And then 30 minutes later, I had a whistle um, that I used to get my dogs to come back um, when they need to. How much does it cost to refill the machine with plastic? It's very insignificant. Um, so that whistle, for instance, probably costs me about 20 cents to make. Um, Larger parts, like I think the most expensive thing I made, which was a, um, I didn't make it, I printed it, but for my nephew, it was a little uh, treasure chest um, piggy bank. And, you know, that was maybe cost me $3.50, you know, in material. And, uh, and you and, can download the template? Yeah, yeah, wow. it was free. So there's a pretty robust community out there of, of, of 3D people printers. that just uh, <laughs> make stuff. And they're like, hey, if you have a, a GE washing machine and you're missing this little you know, a coupler, um, download it for free instead of uh, going on Amazon and buying wow. it. Wow. So it's, it's really, I don't know, for me, it was kind of like stepping into the future, mm -hmm. right? Like, wow, as a kid growing up and seeing like science fiction where replicators and all of that, where now I can just manifest whatever <laughs> I really need yeah. um, within reason, of course. But yeah, it's pretty cool. How much does the machine itself cost? It ranges. I mean, they have machines that, you know, you can get for a hundred bucks that might require a little bit more TLC in order to get it working and, and functioning consistently. I, as you know, someone that's pretty busy and, and my personal time is, is, uh, kind of, uh, relegated, uh, pretty much. I, I didn't want to be fooling around with settings and all of that. So yeah. I got kind of the, the iPhone of 3d printers It's called the, the Prusa mini. Um, which now has been superseded by other easier, better uh, platforms, but kind of similar to the products that I sell, you know, and it's all about ease of use and taking these very complex um, and, and typically 
um, intimidating pieces of equipment and presenting them to people in a way that anybody can use it. It, it really resonated with me. Right. Paying a little bit more, a little bit of a premium for something that I just know is going to work mm -hmm. um, day in and day out. And now I sound like I'm talking to my customers as well. What do you um, sell? So I customers? sell um, two products mainly. Um, one is a um, fluorescence microscope for preclinical pre medical research. Um, so think cancer research, drug discovery, things like that, wound healing, um, just medical research at large. You'd be surprised pretty much every facet is using microscopes at some point. Um, so they're you know not your classic like National Geographic kids microscope right. that you're looking down. This is a... Um, Ranges between about fifty thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You hook it up to a big display, and basically, uh, kind of akin to the three D printer, takes this thing that generally used to require a PhD in physics to to really master. And we have undergraduate institutions that use them. Um, Santa Clara University, my wife's alma mater, has two of them that I sold them on a little cart that they wheel around to different. Um, labs and hook it up to the projector so that the students can really kind of see their you know creations if you will which is you know, maybe a blood smear on a slide or something uh, but in front of their classmates and, and you know get that real-time instruction that you wouldn't be able to get if you were saying hey professor can you come over here and look through these eyepieces yeah. and, and you can't see what they see so that's the one product which is kind of more of the flagship is your target audience represent. primarily Colleges and universities? Um, so it ranges. Um, when we launched the product, um, when I joined Kients um, in 2015, so I started nine days after I graduated here and left, flew out to California, went into training and, and started that. So, um, you know, I lost my uh, my train. What was that? Going into Cali for Kients. But what was the, uh, what was your question? Oh, um the well <laughs> who's your target audience oh yeah so um primarily initially it was academic research right so um, if you think about the field of biotechnology or pharmaceutical you know um, companies at large generally those people have to be trained somewhere right? right they're going to school to get their phd at stanford harvard university of south alabama which is a customer of mine as well um and then they either go into medical research professionally, you know, become a professor or um, what would be called a principal investigator, a PI, who's like the head of a research lab, mm -hmm. um, or you go into industry. Um, companies like Genentech, uh, AbbVie, Merck, um, basically any pharmaceutical commercial that you see, it'll say the company at the bottom. Um, there's uh, a very small handful of large pharmaceutical companies um, and a lot of these people go there so they've used our system you know during their undergrad during their postdoc and then they go out into the real world if you will and um, they continue to want to use it so over time now it's um, primarily like preclinical um, academic research and then um, pharmaceutical companies biotech and then my other product which is a whole different world that I got pulled into recently, which is um, like food and beverage manufacturing um, and environmental monitoring and that type of stuff. So our other product is a, um, an automated colony counter for counting bacteria colonies. So let's say you're producing sweet tea, right? Um, you're going to want to make sure that when that product leaves your facility, there's not dangerous bacteria growing mm -hmm. it. And the way that they have to test for that, which I guess I never really thought of, is they have a lab there and they're swabbing, you know, the machines and taking samples of the, the tea after it's been bottled or whatever product. And then they send it to the lab and put it in an incubator and see what grows. And traditionally, you've got people sitting there manually counting it, right? And there might be 500 little dots on a plate and you have to sit there with a the Sharpie and you know, put a mark on each one yeah. while you're counting and, you know, human beings in large numbers generally don't mix very well um, in terms of, you know, accurately counting. So uh, this product, basically, you just put your Petri dish or whatever it is on there, press a single button, it instantly will count it. There is no 
number of colonies that's too large for this thing to count. So um, it's really interesting technology, but is pulling me out of the prestigious halls of Stanford and Harvard mm-hmm. and putting me, you know, on a manufacturing floor in a chicken processing plant or something like that. Um, which yeah. the, the second technology is also with Kiants. Yeah. Yeah. So Kiants as a company, um, I tell people we're the biggest name you've never heard of. So pretty much any consumer electronic or car or manufactured good, whether it's food or packaging or whatever, um, we make products that will uh, automate that process. Um, so think barcode readers, um, little lasers that will measure the thickness of a, a thin film going on a phone screen as it whips by at 50 meters per second, um, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I'm a part of kind of a little niche aspect of Kians, which is our life sciences group. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be, you know, like employee number four uh, in the group and then have been, um, you know, cruising along and, and helping to grow the team. And um, now I've transitioned more into um, management. So I manage our uh, Northeast team. And then I have my own little purview here on the Gulf Coast. Um, mm-hmm. So when I'm not flying to Boston or New York, I'm driving to Baton Rouge or driving to Birmingham or Tallahassee or New Orleans. Um, so lots of time for listening to podcasts yeah. like this one. Um, and, you know, a number of my other favorites. So um, yeah, and audiobooks. Who else do you like to time. listen to? Um, I like Theo Vaughn. Yeah, he's funny. He's great. I just, he's such a wholesome guy, he right? Is. And I think that um, he's a very good example of don't judge a book by its cover. I think, you know, um, just to an uneducated observer looking at him, he kind of seems a little bit like a doofus. And, <laughs> yeah. um, I think some of that he leans into for his persona, but he's, you know, a really curious and, um, seemingly very intelligent guy and and you know a lot i like i prefer the interviews like with the new york city garbage man he did Mm -hmm. recently or a coroner or just like plucking people out of normal life um, and interviewing them alongside celebrities you know so one week it might be a new york city garbage man and the next week uh, recently they interviewed the red clay strays um, local band which is uh, getting very popular so it's it's just, you know, a good way to spend the right. time. And it's very long form, mm-hmm. right? I Before I was a road warrior, if you will, I don't think I had the attention span for a three-hour podcast, right? But when you're on a three-and-a-half-hour drive and, you know, all that's in front of you is I-10, then, uh, yeah, a three, three-hour podcast, you know, kind of makes it fly by a little right. bit. Um, so, yeah. Theo Vaughn, too, another thing I'm trying to kind of emulate is just he's so comfortable in his own skin, you know? He's just there and present right and i think that that's an incredibly important skill to cultivate Mm -hmm. right you know just a general level of comfortability with who you Mm -hmm. are um and that's not to say that i've got that figured out at all um i think that it is a uh, an active process right it never ends you know figuring out who you are who you want to be where you are in reference to who you want to be um i thought that oh you graduate college, you embark into the real world and, and that's it. You're locked in. Um, but I'm a substantially different person. Yeah. Um, you know, both I think in terms of my goals and what I want to accomplish and also in terms of like what I thought I would be able to accomplish. Um, what are your goals right now? Um, making it to August 15th, which is, um, the expected due date of our first child. Wow. And then, congratulations. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, and so that's going to be turning things on its head, uh, certainly. And, and, you know, kind of will uh, force me to, to reconsider how I go about doing my job and, and, you know, where my time is spent. Mm-hmm. So right now it's kind of both enjoying the peace and quiet, if you will. Um, but also really excited. And, and, you know, I think that's, um, what they would call, you know, big watershed moment. Um, Certainly. And, yeah. My mom says that she always has said that that's the happiest time in life when you have kids or when your kids are young. So we'll see. Was well, she telling you that once you grew up, you were a little bit less enjoyable? To I, guess, I guess. I guess. <laughs> I think my parents would probably uh, echo the sentiment. Maybe like when I was a young child and then about a 
we'll say a 15 year long dark period. Yeah. And then um, early adulthood. I think I came back into mm-hmm. the light a little bit. Um, so it's a journey. You it know? is. But that's what makes it worthwhile. And I heard somewhere it's like the older you get, the smarter you realize your parents are. Cause right. Because kind of grow with them. You know, you realize that all these things that were just kind of implied, right, or that just happened. Yeah, they have like, a lot wait, of Wait, someone was having to, to like thoughtfully plan that out and, and was probably, you know, anxiously, you know, watching by, seeing how everything played out and all of that. And, you know, it's, mm-hmm. I think it's, a great part of you know becoming an adult is that realization, um, and it happens you know pretty frequently. Just like oh, everybody else, your parents included, they're having every thought that you're having, every anxiety that you're having, mm-hmm. every you know bad day that you're having. Like everyone else is also having it, right? right. And I think that for me, that was a big transition, right from being an adolescent or a kid to like, okay, I'm a man or a woman or whatever, you know, an adult, um, is that realization that like, this isn't, you know, me just existing, right? This is everybody Mm -hmm. and they're all going through the same thing, um, or different variations of, of the same thing. Um, and it's just kind of weird, right? It pulls you out of that self-centered, right. you know, oh, me, 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 my life is hard, my day is going terribly, and it's like, you know, you maybe catch a glimpse of someone that you can see is really having a hard time, mm-hmm. and it pulls you out of it, right? And it's like, oh, okay, I'm not the center of the universe. Right, you know? I, I find it kind of comforting that just yeah. with human nature, too, like every problem that you'll be in or encounter, someone else has already encountered. Exactly, and we can all – learn from each other and and i think that that's why it's so important that we are just patient and you know i think that there's a lot to be said about you know spring hill college and and you know the values that are instilled in people through a jesuit liberal arts education and that level of empathy um, and the ability to seek out an understanding of a different experience Um, right so i think that along with just the general well-rounded nature of the education mm-hmm. that people get from here. I mean, I, that is, if we want to talk about things you take for granted, like mm-hmm. the education that I got here, you know, it's one of those things. I just thought, oh, everybody's getting this, right? Everybody comes out of college with the same toolkit, right? An ability to read and write at a high level, an ability to take in high-level concepts and metabolize them and, and understand them. And I think I've realized that that is a relatively unique aspect of a liberal arts education, right? You know, is that broad, um, you know, brush that, you know, we're painting with in terms of, you know, the diversity of, you know, uh, information that is out there, you know, in terms of classes you can take and, and things like that, but also just the general theme of, not being afraid to question, right? Not being afraid to ask why, you yeah. know, right? Don't just tell me that something is the way that it is. That may be, but I want to know why. You know, not to be combative, but because if I understand it better, then maybe I can do more with it. Maybe I can find a better way of doing things, right? And I think that, you know, that really has followed me, you know, from maybe being that annoying student who doesn't just, you know, give in and accept you know, that, you know, there's one way of doing things. Now that's turned into, I think, one of my, you know, greatest attributes, which is, you know, constant questioning of, is this the right way to be doing things, right? I'm willing to just do something because I'm told to do it, but I'd like a conversation. I'd like some explanation and I'd like some input And as well. you'll go even harder if you can fully understand why you're doing something. Exactly. And I think that that, you know, I try to exemplify that in my management. Right. And not just dictating, hey, you need to do this because I was told that I need to tell you to do this. Right. You know, I think that that's selling people short Mm -hmm. and not giving them an opportunity to to really get on board and to really understand kind of what we're shooting for. Um, So, yeah, it's very important to me that whenever I'm asking somebody to do something that I provide them with enough information so that they understand why it's valuable. Right. Right. Because at the end of the day, you're not doing anybody any good by just 
laying things out in front of them and saying, just do this. You will be successful if you follow these exact steps. Because then what happens when they face a hurdle? What happens when things don't go exactly according to plan? Then you have people that lack the ability to be dynamic, right? They don't have that critical thinking toolkit you know, that I'm referencing to allow them to navigate things that might be a little bit outside of, you know, what they were specifically prepared for, you know? Right. When you were, what did you study at Spring Hill? Uh, accounting. So yeah, I made the, uh, you know, the natural leap from uh, an accounting degree to selling microscopes in the yeah. medical research field, right? Everyone does it, huh? What were you planning to sell when you left Spring Hill and went to Keyence? Dude, I had no idea. Um, so, and I think that it might be good for people to hear, right? Like up until, so I said I moved out to California nine days after graduation. Up until a month before graduation, I hadn't applied to a job. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to go get my master's in accounting and go the CPA route. I didn't even really know what sales as a career was. So I did the phone-a-thon um, right. when I was here and um, really enjoyed it. it was, That's just calling alumni? Yeah, calling an al alumni, soliciting donations, bringing them up to speed on what's going on at the university, you know, um, at the time. That's an awesome program. Yeah. I don't um, think that's here anymore. I, I, I don't think it's it's here anymore, and I'm sure that there are good reasons, right? I think that the the way that people communicate and, and the way that, you know, uh, people expect to be um, solicited to, I think, is changing, right? A lot less people are picking up the phone or even have a home phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, if anything, that shows, you know, the ability to be dynamic that I'm talking about is, like, you know, there is no need to just keep doing something because we've always done it, right? Right. But at the time, I'm, I'm very glad that it was here when I was here because that did open up to me that, like, oh, this is actually a skill, right? My ability to talk to people and to connect with them is a skill, is something that I can actually use as a career, um, right? And it took a little while. My mom, like, hey, you're calling people. You'd be good at sales. And I was like, what? Sales? I immediately thought retail sales. Like, what, you want me to go work at Target? Because yeah. I'm good at, yeah, I worked, I was a cashier at Publix. Yeah, I enjoyed that, but I don't think that I want to do that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I was like, sales, really, mom? And she's like, no, Colin, that's not sales, right? Um, and so I started then considering those types of jobs. Frankly, I'm uh, I, probably not the best example. I went on one interview and got the job with Keyens, and um, you know that was all unraveling. Um, whatever the the night of the senior party, um, which I I don't know if they still do that. Yeah, um, they do. But the day that day I had to fly up to Atlanta that morning For the and interview. go do my final interview, and then I flew back and went to the senior party. Yeah, that's um, what I was wondering because no Zoom interviews back no, then. No, yeah, they had to, I had to, um, it was the first time I had ever rented a car um, because, well, the company rented it for me, but I was, I thought, oh, don't you have to be 25 to rent a car? But no, they flew me to Atlanta. I picked up my car and drove to the office. Um, you know, I, I don't even think I had um, like a unlimited data plan on my phone. So it was like, I need to download Google Maps, you know, the, the route on Google yeah. Maps. Um, and then made it there, barely on time, <laughs> did my interview, drove directly back to the airport and flew back uh, back here. And now, um, although my company still does do uh, in-person interview days, so they'll fly people to Chicago for um, big recruiting days because I think it is valuable to sit across from someone and to, mm -hmm. to talk with them uh, if you're given the opportunity. Um, but, yeah, it was a, a whirlwind from there. And then um, the Monday after graduation, I got the call. Hey, you got the job. And I never even unpacked from uh, my dorm in Mobile Hall. I just, uh, we say, um, I shipped my pants um, to California because I did. I put tape on the box with all my clothes, just a big cardboard box when I was packing here, threw a UPS label on it and shipped it to my hotel in uh, Southern California, and then that was it. 
and my Xbox as, and wow. my guitar as a uh, carry on. Um, and then never looked back. Well, How'd you like living in California? Honestly, I loved it. Um, I think that it generally gets a bad rap. Um, I think for warranted reasons in, in certain scenarios, but uh, as far as just how it is living out there, it's beautiful. Um, it's, you know, a great climate. Mm -hmm. I always joked with my friends. It's constantly like mid seventies, um, sunny. I don't think I saw rain for the first three years that I was you know, living in the Bay area. Um, but I quickly realized like, Oh, this place that I was so eager to get out of, you know, right. The, the mobile area. I grew up here, grew up in Daphne, went to McGill Tulin, went to Spring Hill college. My world was incredibly small. And I thought that that meant that I'm leaving something on the table, right? That, you know, there's got to be, you know, better than this, right? Because this is all I knew, you know, aside from a, my early childhood in North Carolina, which I don't really remember that much. Um, but then leaving here and seeing other places and, you know, traveling the country and traveling the world, if you will, made me realize that this is a pretty, you know, pretty choice spot that we've got um, mm -hmm. right here on the Gulf Coast and then became, how can I get back? So it was, I'd say like two to three years in California of like, you know, this is bliss, then how can I get back, right? And and you did a total of seven there? Seven years there. Um, and it took me, I think, a while to get to a place where I feel, where I felt like, you know, I could close that chapter, mm -hmm. um, right? I didn't want to as soon as I got that feeling of, you know, oh, I want to be back home, I didn't want to just go do it, right? I think that, you know, there was more that I wanted to accomplish. Um, and it worked out, you know, um, kind of basically came to a point with Keyence where, you know, it was an unstoppable uh, force and an immovable object. Um, so I left Keyence, took a year off, was very fortunate to kind of live the easy life for about a year. While my wife was diligently working and, and putting food on the table, um, although I, you know, um, I wasn't leaving us, uh, you know, destitute or anything. Yeah. Um, but she got to do a travel contract. We got to live in Santa Barbara um, for four months, nice. which for me was four months of um, just waking up in the morning, grabbing some coffee, walking seven miles with my dog and just wandering around and then coming back home and reheating some Trader Joe's, you know, frozen food for my wife and I to have for dinner. Um, it was fantastic, not sustainable. I would entirely recommend to anyone, if you are ever fortunate enough to take a little break, do it, right? I think that from a mental health standpoint, it was fantastic, um, but also just from a, um, you know, forcing me to reevaluate, like, is right. this what I actually want to do? And I thought, ah, oh, maybe I'll try something new. Went to another company briefly. And then, um, long story short, I mean, without going into too many details, Keynes wanted me back. We made something work. And um, I'm back, you know, doing what I realized I really, really loved doing, which is helping people develop, um, you know, right? Guiding them along their own career journey and, and helping pass along, you know, any sort of uh, ancient wisdom that I've gathered throughout my career. Um, and it's, it's very satisfying to so now. Are you training a sales team? So I, so my day to day is kind of split between my own personal obligations here locally. Is that like, going to see customers? Yeah. Going to see customers. So basically, um, like an average week for me is typically like Mondays in, um, some office. Right. So this week I was I drove up to our Birmingham office um, and then I had a um, like a service call I had to do at UAB. Then yesterday drove out to Baton Rouge, met with the um, pathobiological sciences and their vet med department, um, met with a few people over there, hopped back on the road, took a few virtual meetings with um, the two people I manage, um, some virtual customer meetings to um, help them close some business and, and do some discovery calls from the road, got home around six, hung out. And then today I'm here and I'll go back home. I have a couple more virtual mm -hmm. meetings. Um, and so it, it can range from like my own um, 
personal activities which benefit me um, and as a result my team um, which is also me um, and then other activities which are more developing the salespeople under me managing their day-to-day and then like boring things like expense reports and um, you know things like that yeah when you're going to those customers does can'ts tell you to go to them or are those sought out from you yeah, no, so it's sought out for me. Um, I mean, there's a number of different avenues, right? And I think you'll find with any sales organization, you know, the actual distribution of, you know, where your, um, I guess, activity is coming from um, it can be split between like, okay, if you have a, a robust lead generation, you know, a marketing department, maybe they're um, sending people your way that want meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally, I am in control of, when I am going where. Um, the way we put it is you are the um, CEO of your own territory. Um, so you're given a product and a geographic expanse, you know, territory, if you will. And, you know, there are, I think, um, very robust guide rails um, in terms of showing you, hey, this is what it generally takes to be successful. Um, we call them process metrics, right? So it might take statistically 300 phone calls a month to book 20 meetings a month. And of those 20 meetings, statistically, we can you know, intuit that whatever, 5% of them are going to convert into a sellable opportunity, mm-hmm. something like that. And I'm just making these numbers up. Um, but, you know, we have all sorts of data. I mean, Kians is a, a 50-year-old company that is primarily a sales organization. So treasure troves of data showing you, hey, here is likely what it will take for you to be successful. Um, But ultimately, it's up to you, right? You know, if you're supposed to do 10 meetings a week on average, and that plays out as, you know, three meetings, three days and one meeting another day, then great. If that plays out as six meetings one day and two meetings two other days, great. Um, Right? We don't want 